Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we come to the end of the church year, our focus turns to the last day. And God's word confronts us with the reality that the end is coming sooner or later. And maybe sooner than you might think. On any given day, Christ could return. Or you could die. Last Sunday, we heard the parable of the ten virgins. Five were foolish, five were faithful, and Jesus' point in that parable was be prepared. Because on any given day, he could return, or you could die. But in today's gospel reading, Jesus tells another parable about the last day. This one, though, is more about what happens before that last day day that comes for us, whether it's Christ's return or our death. In this familiar parable, Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Then he went away. Pretty straightforward, right? A man's going on a long journey. Before he leaves, he entrusts his property to his servants. And it's no small amount of property here. One talent is the equivalent of 16 years of wages. So doing some just basic math using the uh, uh, median income per capita, you're, you're talking about uh, the, the guy with the five talents having about $2.5 million, uh, the guy with the two talents over a million dollars, and the guy with the, the one talent, oh, oh a me measly 500000 plus. Now, it's, it's really not hard to figure out, though, what Jesus is saying in this parable. Jesus is the master. He's the one who goes away on a long journey, and he's the one who will return. The question is, what do we do with that which has been entrusted to us? Now, you know how the rest of the parable goes, right? You've heard it before. The servant entrusted with five talents comes back. He's got five more. The guy that had been entrusted with two comes back. He's got two more talents. But the one entrusted with only one digs a hole, sticks the money in there, and he hunkers down and does nothing. Now, interestingly, our Old Testament reading from Zephaniah shows us there's actually one more option that people might choose uh, in, in how they use the talents entrusted to them by the master before the master returns. Zephaniah writes, At that time... I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. This is the attitude a lot of people in our world have today. They live with the attitude that, oh, well, you know what? I don't have to worry about God doing good or doing ill because I don't believe he exists. They live their lives as if there is no God as if there is no master to whom they will have to give an account. But believing there is no God, believing there is no master who will return, doesn't make it so. And really, Zephaniah might actually be talking to us here, too, warning us. Do you give lip service to the Lord, but fail to actually live for the Lord in any real way? Do you go about your life just doing whatever you please without giving a thought to the Lord? Well, going back to today's gospel reading, after a long time, the master finally returns. Now, the master's return is for us either the day of our death or the day of Christ's return, the last day. So the master calls forward his servants entrusted with the five talents. He says, Master, 
You have delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. And the master says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, there's something kind of funny here that we kind of gloss over. We tend to miss as we're reading through this because we don't really know what a talent is. <laughs> so he, the master says, you've been faithful over a little. Over a little, huh? Yeah. Oh, 2.5 million plus. Oh, that's all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Now, he's been faithful over that little. And what does the master say? Now I'll put you over a lot. <laughs> So this is, this is a good reminder for us, right? What seems like a lot to us is insignificantly small to God. And yet he's entrusted it to us, hasn't he? Now the same thing happens with the servant with the two talents. He comes back. He's made two more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over more. Enter into the joy of your master. Finally, we get to that third servant. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And so I was afraid. And I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But the master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed, and I, I gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at the coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then we say, this is the gospel of the Lord, right? <laughs> That's how that gospel reading ends. And it doesn't really seem to match up very well, does it? But what's the point of the parable? Is Jesus saying here, you know what? God's entrusted an awful lot into your hands. And when, when Jesus returns, you had better show a return on investment. Is that what he's saying? Well, no, that's not what he's saying. If that were the case, it would be salvation by works righteousness, wouldn't it? It would be salvation because you have accomplished it. You have gained it. You have des deserved it. And, and that's not how it works at all. The difference between the faithful servants and the unfaithful, the wicked, wasn't so much what they did with the talents, but why. So the first two went boldly to work with the talents because they, they knew their master. They knew he was good. They knew he was a good man and, and that he would be good with them, good to them. They weren't fearful of messing up and losing everything because they, they knew my master is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And so they go to work without fear and they use their talents and they make a return on investment. The wicked servant acted wickedly because he was paralyzed by fear. He thought the master was wicked and as a result, he wanted nothing to do with that talent. The wicked servant acted wickedly because he was afraid of the master. The wicked people in Zephaniah acted wickedly because they didn't think there was a master. But the faithful, the faithful can live faithfully because we know the master. I think the small catechism is really helpful in understanding this. In, in Luther's explanation of that second article of the Apostles' Creed, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ, true God begotten of the Father from eternity, also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me 
right? Bought me back. Redeem me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and innocent suffering and death. That's the master that we serve. That's the master who has entrusted the talents to us. The master who redeems us, who makes us his own, who calls us children of God who makes us children of God. But then it goes on from there, right? Redeem me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sin, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and innocent suffering and death, so that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, right? Just as he has risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. So Jesus has set us free. He has set us free to be faithful. He has redeemed us fully, and so we're set free to serve our neighbor, to serve those around us using the talents entrusted to us by the master. Those talents may be, you know, your, your first article gifts, your, your body and soul, eyes, ears, all your members, your reason and all your senses, your money, your time, all of that, right? You can use that, which has been entrusted to you, but belongs to the Lord, to serve your neighbor without fear. Now, what happens if you mess up? <laughs> That'll never happen, right? Because we are Christians and we don't sin. Oh, wait, no, that's, that's not it at all, actually. That's why we're here. We're Christians and we do sin and we need the grace of God. We need forgiveness. So what happens when we inevitably fail? When we don't do what we ought to do with our talents? Well, you know Jesus, right? You know the Master. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He forgives our sins, sends us on our way once again and says, go use those talents and be faithful. And when we fail again, we come back, we confess, he forgives our sins, he says, now, now go at it, go for it, use the talents. Do what you can do with it. Now, I don't know about you, but as I was reading this parable this year, after eight months of dealing with COVID stuff and lockdowns and all of that kind of stuff, I, I kind of read it through a little bit different light. Because during that time, it's almost as if the government has been saying, you know what? You know what? That, that, third, that third servant? Yeah, be like him. <laughs> Bury your talents and, and just, just hunker down and don't do anything. That's kind of how it's felt, right? And hear me out, I am not saying that we should just disregard all medical information that we're getting and just do whatever you want to do. That's not the point at all. But the parable here does say to us, even now, burying your talent and hiding out in fear isn't an option. As a church, we can't just turtle shell and say, you know what? We'll see you after the vaccine. We can't do that because the, the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be heard by you, by the people of God, whether you're here, whether you're watching online, you need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so do people outside of the church. There's still a desperate need for people to hear of Jesus so that they can come to faith in Christ. And as individuals, we can't just cut ourselves off from everybody and bury our talent and say, you know what, we can't risk anything because it might be dangerous. Now, again, you might need to isolate yourself at home. You might not be able to get together with people in the same way. You might not be able to use the talents God has entrusted to you in the same way you did pre-COVID. Granted. At the same time, we know the master, right? He's redeemed us. 
He's entrusted with us with these gifts for what purpose? To use them. To use them in serving others. To use them in serving him. So now what does that look like? What does it look like to do that with COVID numbers rising? Well, I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like for you. But I can tell you some places where we can start. You can start with your vocations, right? It looks like you, as a father or mother or aunt or uncle, building up a child in the faith, doing devotions with them, sending them a card to encourage them in their Christian walk, giving them a phone call to let them know you're praying for them, that you love them, that, that the things of God are important to you and they ought to be important to them. It looks like you praying for your fellow members. You praying for unbelieving friends and relatives. It looks like, it looks like you praying for your pastor. It looks like you serving, praying for those serving in government. It looks like you praying for those who have lost their jobs. It looks like you praying for those isolated and afraid and alone. It looks like you praying for the end of the pandemic. It looks like you making phone calls. That's right. Using the phone as a phone, not just to text somebody, to actually call them hear their voice, let them hear your voice, to check in on them, to listen to them, maybe to pray over the phone with them. It looks like you sending a card in the mail or this old-fashioned thing that you could still do, writing a letter to someone and sending it in the mail to encourage them in whatever the way they might need encouragement. It looks like you doing devotions with your family. It looks like you being in Bible class, maybe in person, maybe online, but making sure you're hearing that because you want to be built up in the faith, equipped to serve the Lord out of thankfulness for what he's done for you. It looks like you saying to the Lord, Lord, you've redeemed me. You've done all of this for me. You've given me all of this talent to use. Lord, help me to know how to use it and help me to do it. It looks like you using whatever little time you might have left before the end comes, faithfully using the talents entrusted to you by that master who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.